Hello, my name is Stuart Rice, Director of Communications for Shambhal Art, and I'm here today with Steve Saitzik, International Director of Shambhal Art and a good friend. Thank you, Steve, for being willing to sit down with us and answer some questions about Shambhal Art. Oh, my pleasure. Just starting with the fact that we're coming up, I think, on the 25th anniversary of the 1996 Shambhala Mountain Center Dharma Arts Conference, which from my perspective seems to be sort of the, the birth of the modern Shambhala art, but your time, of course, in the community with uh, Dharma art in general is much longer. So I'm wondering if you can take us back to when you met the Vidyadara in 1974 and then how we got to the 96 uh, Dharma Arts Conference. I heard there was a seminar where he was uh, giving uh, uh, some talks and um, they uh, asked if uh, anyone wanted an interview during the seminar, and I raised my hand. I was one of the few who did. I didn't know what an interview was, uh, but uh, I went in to meet him, and we had some conversation, uh, general conversation, and then he asked me if I had a t teacher, and I said, no, I'd kind of uh, given up on uh, looking for a teacher. Mm. I didn't really know what this whole meaning of minds thing was, and... Uh, he said, uh, it's really quite simple. Um, you say something and I understand it. And I say something and you understand it. And uh, then I might have a suggestion for you and you try it and, and, it, and it works. Mm. So I asked him if he had any suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, uh, yes. And he sent me on a home retreat for mm. a week and about halfway through I realized that there was a certain sanity that I hadn't experienced before. And then I, next time I met him, I brought uh, the artwork I'd been working on, which was a combination of Western and uh, uh, Tibetan iconography. Mm. And uh, it was a, an interesting meeting, but it, what it came down to is he ultimately said, in his little high voice, I'd like to work with you. <laughs> and in my arrogant ways at the time, I said, sure. <laughs> and that started it. Then we ended up with a five-part program and kind of went from there. So the period of 1987 when the Vidyadara passed away to 1996 is a fairly large gap. And I have a sense that there was really this kind of pause yes. in the teachings. And yes. during that time, what were, how were you personally perpetuating the teachings? What were you doing in terms of Dharma art and Shambhala art? Well, I was giving talks and collecting notes and um, uh, not to doing a great deal. Because mm. uh, when he passed away, there were some individuals who thought that only he could uh, teach this material. So there was uh, uh, those who continued on. But uh, mostly what happened was, kind of, you might say, Dharma art events mm. rather than a teaching. There would be something where... People might gather and do some painting or uh, no formal exercises that I know of and no formal teaching. They were just kind of fun events. Uh, there weren't many of them, but that uh, took up uh, what, what took place in, before 1994. In this sort of period between 1987 and 1996, there just wasn't much. And at least I get a sense the Shambhala, uh, the Dharma teachings were kind of cut off. Like there was this sort of immediate yeah. lack of them. And then in, you know, in 96, we have this sort of sense of we're coming, uh, we have teachers, longtime Dharma art practitioners coming together with uh, uh, the Sakyong to kind of shift the gears and, and start to perpetuate and move them forward. And I'm curious just about, you know, was there significance in the timing of that? Was it that, um, was it the right time for those teachings to emerge? What was your sense of just the, timing around that whole shift? Well, I know he wanted to see something happen um, because um, one of the reasons uh, it seems to me that it didn't make, uh, it didn't, it got kind of cut off is because of this uh, stagnation of um, uh, individuals who worked with uh, Vidyadra who basically uh, had uh, kind of um, their connection and what they learned and uh, didn't really know how to merge with anyone else. Uh, Mipan Rinpoche asked me to take my some 
300 pages of my personal notes on iconography and these teachings and to share it with other uh, then Dharma art uh, old dogs in the hopes that they would uh, share uh, what they had uh, worked on. And uh, we got very little response. Mm. So I, I actually asked him if he would relieve me of this assignment, <laughs> which he ignored. And we talked about uh, developing the program uh, further. Since the establishment of the five-part curriculum, I took the intensive in 2016. And I'm sure that there's been some evolutions along the way. What would you say have some, been some of the major changes in the curriculum or ways that you've approached it since the sort of initial experimentations in 94 through 96? Well, one of the major things that first come to mind is uh, the renaming of um, Dharma art to Shambhala art. Mm. Basically, what it was is we felt we needed to trademark um, the uh, program, mm -hmm. and we discovered that Dharma art had been, that phrase, that term, had been out in the public domain way too long, mm -hmm. so we couldn't do it. So we had a number of uh, senior students got together. I don't know if it was like eight or so, but uh, we had to come up with another name, and mm. um, uh, out of eight participants, I think we had three times that number of suggestions. Sure. And being uh, typical artists, uh, no one would agree to anyone else's. <laughs> so uh, I voted for somehow trying to continue on with uh, Dharma art. Uh, but Mipan, after reporting to Mipan Rinpoche, he said, look, why don't we just call it Shambhala art? Mm. And we needed to do that because it was the only way to copyright the mm -hmm. Dharma art teachings. It's the way the legal system works. Sure. So in terms of the curriculum, like I know, for example, yeah. part two used to be called sign and symbol, and now it's yeah. called something different. So just other sort of things that even little things that may have transformed around the, the five parts and well, their content. The other big uh, thing that uh, we did is um, try to uh, uh, diminish the jargon, the Shambhala and Buddha Dharma mm. jargon so that we could make this more accessible. And that was a a big deal because a lot of us would fall into our home uh, base in some sense uh, and use language that uh, you know the public would go huh <laughs> so that was uh, difficult for some people mm. we changed titles uh, experimenting a little bit in terms of the titles of it uh, but the core teachings are pretty much uh, the same it's still about you know perception and uh, experience and how those uh, things work and, mm -hmm. and uh, things that people uh, may have already read at the website or uh, through Shambhala Times, I wrote some articles and, and then they could take the program and find out. Right. So we've had the five part structure for quite some time now. Yes. And I'm wondering what's next for it? Is that is that five parts complete or is there something more that we need to explore in terms of uh, the Shambhala art teachings? Well, first of all, it's, sorry to use some jargon, but <laughs> um, the Dharma art teachings are basically what is referred to as Mahamudra teachings, the great symbol. Whereas we're a Shambhala organization, mm -hmm. uh, there are the Shambhala teachings. So uh, I think we need to bridge uh, that gap. I asked uh, Mipram Rinpoche if he would address that uh, several times. The last time I got a note back saying, you do it, which uh, it makes me a bit nervous, but mm -hmm. I've been trying to get input from students and participants and stuff, and we experimented a little bit with it uh, in this last uh, graduates and teachers retreat. If we have time, I'd like to come back a little bit to the Buddha Dharma basis of Shambhala art. But switching gears a bit, you know, one of the things that um, I remember reading in the editor's introduction to True Perception, which is a collection of the Dharma art talks that uh, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche gave, was that Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche was very interested in and taught often through things like environment and gesture and you know artistic expression. As kind of a heritage teaching coming out of those uh, that Dharma art view, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how those things manifest in Shambhala art. Teaching Shambhala art, as Mipan Rinpoche has said, is to, we teach through symbol, mm. which means direct experience. Mm. So we try to create exercises which uh, draw people back to their uh, experience. Oh. 
in some sense, we could say we encourage uh, participants to um, lead with their, uh, as I refer to as the, their felt sense, mm. their non-conceptual mind, their intuitive sense, uh, and then uh, uh, let the thought sense arise out of that, mm-hmm. kind of the first thought, best thought. Mm. So uh, it's hard to, uh, it, it, you can tell people lead with your felt sense and let your thought sense arise, uh, but it's not easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're so uh, trained to um, lead with our thought sense, mm-hmm. which uh, modifies and edits the felt sense so that uh, we get what we think rather than what we experience. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the reasons why meditation is so important and uh, doing the program uh, exercises and engaging those uh, fully uh, help us to wake up to the possibility that we can actually lead with uh, our felt sense. So one of the things that I really enjoyed about the Shambhala art training was being able to watch the video uh, Discovering Elegance, which was the LA installation that the uh, Vidyadra did. And I, I understand that he also did one in Boulder and also one in San Francisco. And it seemed so um, important to him to create environment, that these environmental installations were in some ways uh, a very full expression of what he was trying to teach. And I'm wondering if you could you know, talk a little bit about the sort of role of environment um, in Shambhal art and maybe even in life in general from the Vidyadra and from the Shambhal art point of view. Environment is so important because we're so affected by it. Mm. Um, we're not affected just by the fact that we can recognize something as a painting or a calligraphy, uh, but the uh, content of it and the presence of it uh, affect us uh, greatly. Mm. Uh, I just flashed on uh, a uh, series of talks that he did on, I think it was called Vajrayani Iconography, it was um, I helped put the study guide for it, but I'm not quite sure. They, I think they ended up calling it True Perception mm. uh, after the book. Uh, but he was trying to convey this notion of symbol. Mm. And uh, he was trying to get people just to, in Boulder, just to go outside and look at the rocks and the mountains. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people didn't really quite get what he was talking about and, until much later on. It's not just about making uh, pretty pictures or having nice wallpaper, uh, but uh, you're trying to create a wakeful space, Mm. one that wakes you up rather than puts you to sleep. Mm. So we, you know, in Shambhala we talk about balance and harmony, but people sometimes mistake that for uh, balance meaning boring and harmony is let's all go to sleep, Mm. put ourselves to sleep. When it's about wakefulness, it's balance is about bringing wakefulness to a sleepy situation. Harmony is making things resonate so they have a sense of presence and a life of their own. So it's uh, taking the language and playing with it a little bit. Your response is, it's obvious that the language is important. Um, And I know that for the Vidyadra, using language and using language to communicate Um, in very precise ways was really important. I remember reading both in True Perception and in your book, Place Your Thoughts Here, about uh, discipline and spontaneity. And those are two words that I think for me, when I think of discipline, it often has a very negative connotation of hard work or punishment. And spontaneity can often mean um, a sense of just kind of um, acting out impulsively. And I have a sense that that's not quite what the vidyadra or you meant with those terms. Could you say more about that? Well, they, they do, uh, to many people, seem to be the opposite of one another, uh, discipline and spontaneity. But they actually uh, work together. Um, spontaneity is not impulsiveness. It's not reactiveness. Um, there's another word, too, for it. But it's basically about being tuned in. Spontane- you can't be spontaneous unless you're tuned in. Mm. You know, you're resting, uh, hopefully, all your senses on the environment and everything. And uh, um, with the, the role of discipline is to help you be tuned in. Mm. Uh, 
uh, discipline is uh, from this point of view is uh, all about coming back to square one and your senses and being present and that provides the ground for spontaneity spontaneity to be spontaneous <laughs> so in terms of spontaneity and discipline and you you brought up the term square one which is really important in shambhala art and also um earlier the idea of wakefulness um and you also brought in felt sense, and we also have thought sense. Is felt sense really connected to the idea of, of being awake through all the senses? Is that what we mean by felt sense? Well, with uh, some neuroscience and cognitive science, there's so much more going on than our conscious mind. It's actually a very small uh, portion. We just think because we can think about thinking that uh, we have the entirety of the experience, but our body and our senses, uh, I think I've mentioned to you uh, previously that uh, every second we take in about 11 billion bits of uh, sensory information of which mm -hmm. they estimate only 200 rise to the level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So there's so much more going on. So when leading with felt sense is not just some kind of touchy-feely thing, but it's actually uh, stuff that goes beyond our conscious uh, mind. So when we ask people to be in square one, it seems like we're asking them to prioritize felt sense over thought sense. Is that uh, accurate? Well, it's less a, a motivational uh, thing to do than when you meditate and come to rest in a sense in your senses naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, felt sense automatically precedes uh, thought sense all by itself. Mm. So if you leave it alone, it works. Mm. The thing is, we don't trust that our uh, senses are enough. Mm. Uh, so we start interfering with it, which ends up filtering and distorting our experience. We want uh, a direct experience. Uh, when we do uh, uh, contemplative viewing of artwork, it's, uh, uh, we encourage people to forget what they know about the picture, don't read the label, and spend some time resting their senses on it so they can have their own experience before, uh, and their thought sense will take care of itself when we ask them to write down, catch some thoughts that arise in the experience and share those. And then we begin to find that we describe the, uh, uh, the work uh, quite well. Uh, uh, it's a, I have to tell you one funny thing is that for us is that often while we're doing contemplative viewing, um, I have to tell the participants to make sure you leave room for other people to come and, and look. And inevitably we have a few people who just kind of run through the, hmm. the people, uh, us, and take out their camera phone, snap a picture, and then run away. Uh, take a picture of all of you just standing there looking at No, of the artwork. Oh. <laughs> as, as if they could capture the presence of it uh, in their mm. little uh, phones and, uh, and that's enough. Mm. Uh, by seeing it later uh, in that, uh, and ignoring the present moment mm. and taking advantage of uh, having that experience. Mm. So what we're trying to do is to show that this is something that you can integrate into your life and not just uh, um, for a, a little exercise mm. when we do these field trips. So one of the things you were just talking about was you know, taking these teachings into our lives and there's a little bit of a cheeky question that I wanted to ask. Oh, based, really? Yeah, of course. Based on, um, based on a story, I once read you know, that the um, Vidyadara had a form for everything, you know, how we would do things in our daily lives. And that one of the things that he wrote about was how to make a cup of tea, um, how, uh, how a person in Shambhala should make a cup of tea. And um, I wanted to ask you, from the Shambhala art perspective, how would we make a cup of tea? Um, well, I'm, I'm always reminded of this uh, story about the Zen master and the apprentice. And the apprentice had to go away and ask his master if there was something he could take with him, uh, you know, as part of his practice. And the master, by the way, this I originally saw this in Hairbrain Tortoise Mind, mm. uh, how... Um, and to how what intelligence increases when you think less, mm. something like that. Um, and it's been in other books, uh, the story. But the um, Zen master does a calligraphy and, and it says attention. <laughs> so the uh, apprentice uh, looks at it and 
says, uh, well, um, you know, is that, that it? And, and the master then uh, does another calligraphy that says, attention, attention. <laughs> and then uh, the uh, novice is uh, just like totally irritated. Like, is that all you've got to say? That's the best you've got? And uh, he then uh, takes out some more paper and a brush and ink and uh, writes, attention, attention, attention. So to me, that's always meant you just really have to pay attention. Mm. But uh, Trump Rinpoche would, uh, I was always fascinated watching him, like when he would, uh, when His Holiness the 16th Karmapa came for a visit, you know, he'd make sure the forks and the spoons were lined up. Mm. Uh, he he always would tell us to pay attention to the details. Mm. So, and again, I think that comes back to just this immense importance of environment um, and how we create space, the mm -hmm. spaces that we create. And I often find for myself when you know I've done shambhala and exercises or practice is that um, one of the things that really happens when I shift from really feeling in and, and coming back to square one is that thought sense takes over and space seems to really shut down. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, the role that space plays in these teachings and why it's so important. Part of it is learning to trust space. We, mm. When we're confronted with space, we try to figure it out and um, uh, we often, our reaction to it is kind of uh, uncertain and amb ambiguous and um, can't quite think of the word, but um, there's a lot of uncertainty. You don't know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so we try to solidify space because we know like wh what a rock's gonna do if we pick it up and we drop it. Mm. We don't really know what space is gonna do if it does anything at all. Mm -hmm. um, science now says that space is, is not really the kind of space we thought it was and mm -hmm. there's a lot of energetic stuff going on in space right so it's helpful to appreciate that space isn't just space mm -hmm. at the same time it provides the opportunity for new things to arise uh, uh, one of the things that uh, we talk about in meditation is creating some space for something to arise and be recognized as inspiration mm -hmm. there's a real sense that i have that for myself and I'm sure this is common, is that there's a real fear that arises in response to that uncertainty. You know, even doing something very simple like a, a calligraphy exercise in Shambhala, there's a lot of sort of anxiety and fear around making a, a mark. mark. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, is there, is there a role for that energy in the practice? Is that something we're supposed to be working with? You mean the reaction to the space? Yeah, that fear, well, the fear that, you know, how fear can often arise when we're going to sort of um, move out into space and, and relate to it. So how, are you asking uh, how to get rid of the fear, how to work with the fear, how to accentuate the fear? It seems like, it seems like for me, fear is often associated with panic. Yeah, well, we, we don't want to panic. Uh, <laughs> fear is okay, panic is not good. Mm. And why is that? Well, because you've lost it. You're, you've narrowed down. You're completely absent from your, your, instead of being tuned in to the space and the environment and your senses, you're just caught up in your thoughts mm. and emotions uh, that have gone, that are just going stark raving mad. Uh, so uh, uh, fear is a good thing, it, in my opinion. It uh, tends to keep us honest if you don't mm. shut down, if you don't panic. Mm -hmm. It's just energy uh, and can be uh, actually energy for the creative process. People need to practice. Uh, that's really where you get a sense of space where you have an opportunity for all of the things and a myriad of things to arise and be seen in a, basically a safe environment because it's just you and your mind and the space that you're in. Mm. You know, we have to start somewhere. So I know we like to start at the end. I'm going to tell another story. Uh, to begin with, first of all, I tend to talk about stories about myself because that's all I really know and have <laughs> and this experience. So I, I don't want to lose uh, the notion that there are many other students and people who have contributed to uh, Dharma art and Shambhala art and 
uh, have had long-time relationships with Trump Rinpoche and Mipam Rinpoche. So I just want to clear the deck on that one. So it's not just massive me uh, <laughs> doing it all, but we have to start somewhere. So um, the meditation instruction we fundamentally get in Shambhala art and most of Shambhala is uh, very much like the meditation instruction that's given at the end of your path. Mm. And uh, uh, so I read about this instruction for Mahamati meditation. And then I had the good fortune to uh, meet with uh, His Holiness uh, Dilgo Kense Rinpoche, um, who is a, a close friend and teacher of Trumper Rinpoche and also mm -hmm. a teacher of Mipam Rinpoche. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, had the good fortune to have a private meeting with him, uh, with just the translator and him and I. And one of the questions that I asked him, and I said, it seems like the first instruction we get, which seems so simple, mm -hmm. uh, is the same as the last instruction that we get. Uh, is that true? And, and if it is, what's all that stuff in between with the prostrations and the visualizations and all the other stuff? Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, animated his, uh, his uh, response and he basically said, well, you don't actually get the original instruction until you go th through all those other things and come back. Mm. So I know we like to start at the end uh, rather than the beginning, but if you start at the beginning, you're starting at the end. I'd like to you know, touch on the idea that um, you mentioned earlier that you know, the next thing for um, Shambhala art is really to bring it in alignment with the Shambhala teachings you know, as it is arising out of this traditional Tibetan Mahamudra vision um, in its current incarnation. One of the things that is often said in Shambhala that Shambhala is all about creating enlightened society. And I'm wondering if you would say a bit about what you see the role of Shambhala art being and even art generally in the creation of an enlightened society. Uh, well, there's a couple of aspects to that. Uh, well, one is, as Mipam Rinpoche has said, that uh, Shambhala art is the essence of an enlightened society. I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but um, I think it's important to understand that there's uh, our heritage of uh, teachings uh, have both uh, peaceful, semi-wrathful, and wrathful deities, mm. uh, which in uh, the... Uh, they're not like gods mm -hmm. in the way we picture gods. They're representatives of enlightened principles. Mm. And uh, uh, I've been one of the people who advocated that we understand that art doesn't need to put us to sleep mm. or console us. Mm -hmm. uh, it can actually be quite challenging and disturbing, just as uh, the Tibetan iconography was uh, well, when the missionaries went into Tibet and they saw all this stuff, they thought it was devil worship and burnt and destroyed so much artwork. Uh, so sad is they didn't really understand that these were uh, re representatives of how one transforms one's poisons into wisdom. Mm. So I think uh, that's the kind of role that Shambhala art needs to play in enlightened society is to uh, bring out the the things that are hanging out, uh, mm. as well as the things that are uh, really uh, pleasant. So uh, advocates for, uh, you know, a true enlightened society rather than one that we just think of as enlightened, but actually feels and, and is manifesting some genuine kindness. You know, and kindness can manifest itself in kind of wrathful ways. Mm. Uh, but, you know, as a teacher, you have to be very cautious about exercising that because uh, unless you're really very accomplished, you're going to lull yourself into thinking that, you know, just because you see it clearly that you somehow have these abilities uh, that you may not have. Mm. So you have to be very cautious and circumspect about manifesting some things. So in that sense, it seems that Shambhala art really has some, something to help to help us work with those sometimes difficult yes. energies or aspects, or to yes. at least at least develop some bravery around working with yes. them. Yes, uh, negativity is a big issue that we bring up in part five, mm. and uh, I'll talk about eventually a part six in a moment. 
But in uh, part five, uh, we learn that there's uh, negative negativity, which uh, is self-destructive and and not good, hmm. and positive negativity, which is uh, when we strip away our attachments to what's occurring in a negative situation, we feel uh, energy. Mm. Uh, and it's actually energy for the creative process, as it turns out. In part six, we're trying to make that connection to Shambhala teachings. We're not trying to redo Shambhala art in uh, Shambhala Dharma, Shambhala jargon. Mm -hmm. We're trying to bridge it to it. Mm. Um, because uh, uh, sh you might say Shambhala art comes out of the tradition, uh, well, we're trying to bridge it from Mahamudra to what's called Ati, mm. Maha Ati, which is a Ningwa tradition, kind of uh, old dog kind of situation, maybe for scholars to look up <laughs> uh, in case they, they don't know, but it's uh, bridging two uh, powerful traditions and uh, using uh, Shambhala teachings to do it, it's kind of Shambhala Yana. Mm. And this whole conversation is I'm so often discover for myself when thinking about Shambhala art is that I feel like at some point we start talking about art as in sort of a creative discipline like painting or sculpture yeah. and somehow we end up in everyday life. Yeah. Uh, somehow we end up shifting from the thought that this is about art as a kind of discipline to a kind of artful way of being in the world. And I imagine that that's actually um, the intent, ultimately, of where these teachings or what these teachings are trying to point out, that there's really something about everyday life here going on. Well, these teachings are so much about appreciation, and mm. uh, appreciation doesn't just begin and end with looking at a work of art. Uh, you know, we appreciate each other, appreciate an environment, appreciate the food, appreciate being alive. Um, so, you know, you start out uh, thinking that uh, you're in an art program and you discover it's all about how to live one's life. Hmm. I think I've said this to you also. I somehow came up with this notion that it's not just art in everyday life, it's life in everyday art. But it mm. sounds good. I don't know if it completely works. <laughs> it's uh, sometimes difficult to get people to uh, come to the program who are professional artists. Mm. Because uh, either they've been politicized already so much, uh, or they just figure it's, uh, you know, in the format that it's in, it doesn't uh, suit them. Mm. Uh, and then it's uh, sometimes hard to get non-artists to come because they figure it's for artists. Mm. Mm -hmm. So uh, artists uh, look at it like, oh, this is a program for non-artists. Uh, they just want me to show up. <laughs> And uh, those people who are not artists think it's above them, mm. uh, when in fact it's for everybody. Right. It seems so timely that we're talking about appreciating our world, because our world, at least now, you know, depending upon how you measure it, is maybe going a bit sideways on a on a kind of grand scale. And it it seems like Shambhal art is really answering a need that we have at this time to to really come back to seeing our world as it is and, and really appreciating it for what it is. And, you know, you've been a long time student of these teachings and just wondering if you could share maybe one final insight about, you know, how these teachings have helped you appreciate the world and find ways of appreciating the world, even when it in difficult circumstance. There's so many things that uh, I could respond, but I think the thing that pops into mind is one of the th you know, themes that run through the, all of uh, Shambhala art, and that is um, the simple notion of seeing things as they truly are, mm. as opposed to how we uh, hope they are, think they are, fear they are. Uh, and that uh, the program itself, as well as my experience, has been uh, to go deeper and deeper into that. Because mm. uh, uh, seeing things as they are is multi-leveled. Mm. Uh, it's not just... Uh, you know, seeing this glass and the water is glass and water. There's more to it than than, uh, than that in terms of our experience. Uh, so it's experiencing things as they are, not just seeing them, tasting them, touching them, and so forth. 
So um, you can't really change or grow if you can't see things as they are. Mm. Um, this is not necessarily 100% true, but when you're teaching someone, uh, I understand, to draw, uh, you're really teaching them how to see. Mm. And there's this difference between looking and seeing, mm. which is where we um, have bare attention, where we're resting our senses on whatever it is, uh, whether it's seeing or hearing or whatever. And then um, uh, we have an aha experience, uh, which is seeing. Mm -hmm. And the two of them work together. One is we need to be able to see things as they are. And then we need to be able to work with them as they are. Uh, mm. to manifest them uh, and I guess uh, one of the th things just to add to that a little offshoot is that uh, a number of times I've had artists uh, say to me uh, but my uh, artwork is my meditation mm. and uh, my response is usually um, that may be true mm. uh, but you cannot know that until you develop a formal practice mm. Otherwise, it, it could be imagined. Hmm. So that's what I recommend, and that's how I've been affected. Thank you very much. Oh, you're more than welcome. So staying with that theme of appreciation, thank you so much for taking this time to answer some questions and to share your personal experience and expressing appreciation to you on behalf of both myself and our audience of viewers uh, for sharing all this with us. Thank you. Oh, again, it's good karma for me to, to help in any way I can. To learn more about Shambhala Art, please visit our website at www.shambhalaart.org. Thank you.